But again, spring break, right? Grace upon grace. Good morning. You're like, we did it once. Leave us alone. Um, hey, this is for my sake, and you'll have to give me a few moments to do it because I'm the one with the microphone. Uh, I don't expect you to remember this, but if you do, good. Uh, a couple of months ago, probably at this point, I started my sermon telling a story about a friend who called me and said, hey, I've got a guy I'd like for you to meet with. He's made a mess of his life. And so I met with this guy and uh, kind of told his story to me. And I said, hey, here's what I think's happening. I think you're making a chapter of your book, the title, but it's not true. Like this chapter is gonna be significant, but it's not the headlines. Most of you don't remember that, I do. Uh, this morning, that guy got baptized. Yeah. Now, we're, we're cheering for the Lord, right? Because only God does something like that. Because here's what happens. The guy that did the baptism, Devin, friend of mine, not on staff at our church, calls me and goes, hey, he needs to meet with a pastor. And I said, okay, I'm one. Brad, who just got dunked, had just started kind of dipping his toe into the water of figuring out if maybe this is a place for him because of the wreck he'd made of his life. And there's no way that years ago when Devin calls and says, hey, I got a guy, would you meet with him? I would ever gone, well, of course, Devin, because one day you're gonna get to be in the water at Fellowship Church as a pastor and baptize your friend that you've walked faithfully with, right? But here's why we do things like this, and here's why we call them out, is because if you ever count God out, you're in the wrong. But some of us show up regularly to places like this and to small groups and to other little Bible studies or wherever you find yourself and you've, you've started the equation counting God out. You show up going, yeah, this is church. I know what church is. And we started on the wrong space. And when you start on the wrong space in a game, what do people say? They're like, oh no, you can't start there. Go back to the beginning. But so many of us start with God at the wrong space. And so I'm just inviting you, however you showed up this morning, Spencer started us this morning going, maybe some of you just need to kind of go, maybe a little bit of an expectation on God this morning. Maybe some of you, even as I'm about to talk for however many minutes I talk, I'm not gonna put a time on it because some of you will be like, you went longer, quit judging. Um, <laughs> maybe some of you just need to go, God, I've started on the wrong space this morning. If I'm honest, I showed up with very little expectation that you might do something in my life. And the testimony of a grown man crying over his sin and the testimony of a child going, I don't know, it was just compelling. I can't put words around it other than first John would say, I just know the love of the father. And some of you are going, man, I wanna be like that man strong and courageous in the face of hundreds. But the invitation might be for you to be like the child and say, I don't know, God, but I, I sense you love me. And that'd be okay too. So I'm gonna pray for you and I'm gonna pray for me and then we'll jump into Matthew. Lord Jesus, it's possible that we could stop right now and that would be enough but we're gonna press on trusting that you have even more for us in your word. We thank you for the corporate body. As we come together, uh, we are reminded of your goodness towards us. To sing the songs that come out of our heart of just saying, Lord, we do love you and we wanna praise the name of the Lord our God. That's the only reason we're here. Not to be church people, but to praise the name of the Lord our God. Lord, I pray over the next few minutes as I open up your word, uh, you would do the impossible, that you would take written words and spoken words and make dead things alive. As we look at a story of a woman's affection for you, stir our affections for you, please. Not in a church way, but in a deep, uh, residual living outside of this room kind of way. Lord, I pray for the two men who were baptized today, one a little bit older. May their stories just continue to reverberate through our hearts. 
May we continue to see your goodness towards them. We love you. We thank you. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Um, Matthew 26 is where I'm going to be. If you'd like to find it on your Bible, on your pad, iPad, on your phone, wherever you are, that'd be great. Uh, this morning, what we're looking at is we've been continuing to look at Holy Week in the life of uh, Jesus and Matt, the Gospel of Matthew. And where we've been for the last couple of weeks is really nearing the end of Holy Week. And Jesus has been talking about what the end of the times is gonna be like. And really what this does is really set off the chief priests and the elders to be like, it is officially time that we get rid of this guy. I mean, we, we can't have him doing what he's doing anymore. And so the story that we're gonna look at this morning finds itself sandwiched, sandwiched between two really betrayals. The first is the chief priest. They are just a few verses before where we're gonna be this morning and we'll look more at depth in it next week. But right before this uh, is really when the chief priests are going, all right, what is our plan? How are we going to actually get Jesus? And then right after this is where uh, Judas famously just betrays Jesus. And so between the chief priest saying it's got to happen and Judas saying I'll help it happen, we have this love story right in the middle. And you could ask yourself, interesting, Matthew, that between the chief priest and Judas, you put this story, but I think there's a real reason why, as all scripture is inspired by the Spirit of God, and I think the reason why is because Matthew wanted his believers to know this, that it is a beautiful thing it is a beautiful thing when the worth of Jesus and the love of his followers corresponds. It is a worshipful thing when, when we see Jesus for who he really is and our affections match. Because all around the world is gonna be saying, you don't have to live your life like that. The culture is going to say, hey, you don't have to go down that road of giving your life to Jesus. And Matthew's going, hey, everyone around you culturally is going to be saying, how are you gonna make sense of Jesus? What are you going to do as an individual? What are you going to do with this figure that we would call the God man? What are you gonna do with him? Because culture's gonna tell you to try to trap him and make light of him. And others are gonna say, just turn your back on him. You're in college for crying out loud. These are the years where you'll make the most money. Live for yourself, betray Jesus. But instead, Matthew, right in the middle of those two extreme stories, tells us a story of when the value of Jesus' perfections are really seen and the intensity of our affections correspond with who he is, it changes things. So my hope for all of us this morning, myself included, even as I teach the passage, is that Jesus would do two things. One, show us how valuable he is, how worthy he is and him alone. And then as, as we see him for who he really is, he would help our intensity for him, our affections for him to match his worth. Now perfectly, no, never on this side of heaven but maybe a little bit more. Maybe this week I could be a little bit more turned towards Christ in my affections and the way that I think about him. Maybe this week I could be a little bit more engaged in the way that I think about Jesus. So Matthew chapter 26, we see this love story. It starts in verse six and it says this. Now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment and she poured it on his head as he reclined at a table. Now, the first thing that happens when we read this story is it is so other than us, we could get lost. And yeah, this has never happened to me. I've never seen somebody at dinner come up and be like, hey, could I put some perfume on you? Now, there have been times with my uh, middle school and high school age kids, I've been like, maybe that should become a new thing in our house to be like, as you come to dinner, here's some ointment because there's something going on over here, right? But don't let it get lost on you of going, oh yeah, well this, I've actually heard this story before, JC. Don't let it get lost on you because it's so countercultural to what we do to think, oh, good for this woman who was hanging out at this guy's house to do something so extreme. 
I'll help us, I hope, at the end, try to figure out how can we make this more practical to our life. But here's what we see at the beginning. Jesus was at Bethany, about two miles outside of Jerusalem. So he has been in Jerusalem teaching. He's been in Jerusalem talking to all the folks. He's been stirring up a ruckus, honestly. And at some point in the week, he says, hey, let's withdraw out to Bethany. Again, about a two-mile walk. And he finds himself at Simon the leper's house. So what do we learn about our Jesus What is one of the first things we would look at and go, man, he's so worthy, he's so amazing, he's so other, that at this moment, Jesus could have had the attention of anybody in town. Because of what he was doing and because of it being Holy Week, anybody could have said, hey, I want time with Jesus, and or Jesus could have said, I want time with them, and anybody in town would have said, yeah, I'm interested in having a meal with you because you were stirring up some things. But he's not at the governor's house. He's not sitting with people in authority. And the disciples had to be going, Jesus, this is our time. Remember like just a couple of days ago, you rode in on the donkey and everybody was shouting for you. Now is your time to have influence over the entire religious system. Is this when we like take that over? Now is the time like we could influence Rome, I think. Like we got enough people on our side. Like you wanna influence some folks? Who do you wanna have dinner with tonight? He's like, hey, let's two mile journey out to the leper's house. Oh, okay. Still, that's still your emojis? Like that's still how you're gonna operate? When you're at your peak power, the leper's house? He's like, yeah, let's go, let's go back to Simon's house, the leper. So maybe some of you this morning, that's the first thing you need to be reminded of about this Jesus we love. That never is Jesus distracted from those who are in need. Never does Jesus minimize those who are hurting. Never does Jesus say, I just don't have space for you. Now you might go, well, what is this guy, Simon, and why is his name the leper? If you don't know, leprosy was a horrific disease. It would have spread like crazy. They would have been outcast because of the disease. Previously, Jesus has healed this leper and they're still calling him that, which for a while I thought, man, how unfortunate for him to be like, Simon the leper. And he's like, not anymore, guys. I'm clean, actually. I don't know if you've seen, but like healed. Jesus did a work. Why don't we move on from that? But then, again, second service isn't gonna get all this because they're not gonna see the same baptisms. Sorry for them. But did you, did you hear Brad in the tub? He wasn't going, oh, whoa. He was going, no, that was me, but this is what Jesus has done. Right? There was almost like a little bit of a, yeah, sure, I I royally messed some things up, but look at what Jesus has done. And so I wonder if they're like, oh, Simon the clean guy. And he's like, no, 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 no. I wanna be Simon the leper because I never want you all to forget what this guy can do. Call me Simon the leper. But you're not a leper anymore. That's not the point of the story. The point of the story is I know a guy who brings dead things to life. I'm case in point. And so what I, I don't know, I'm reading into this, but I'm curious if Simon said, keep calling me the leper because I never wanna forget what God's done in my life. Some of you are so insulated from your past, you've forgotten the power of what he's done. Don't live in it. Don't let it define you but be aware enough of what God has done in your life that you're not ashamed of it anymore. Oh, that doesn't define who I am anymore. God has taken something that was dead and killing me and made me alive. So this is the first thing we see about our Jesus is that he goes and hangs out with a people who most would not have thought. Even more surprising is at this dinner, a woman comes up to him. Culturally, this would have been really outside of bounds for a woman to come up to a man at a meal unless she's serving, and this is a cultural thing, but to really engage him, people really have been going, Jesus, what is going on here? But not only does this woman come up to him, but she comes up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment. Other uh, gospels tell us it was called nard, which if you're in marketing, bring that one back. Uh, Comes up to a very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. Other gospels would tell us that this woman was Mary. Uh, We can't confirm that in Matthew because there are a couple of different stories. But most scholars would say, yeah, this is Mary, the sister of Lazarus who was raised from the dead. And so we've got quite a who's who here, right? 
I mean, Jesus, Simon the leper, and Mary, whose brother has been raised from the dead. She comes up to him with an alabaster flask. If you were to do a little research on what this perfume would have been worth, other gospels tell us over a year's wage. So just imagine a a working man's wage. She comes up with this alabaster flask and there wasn't like a spray option in those days. There wasn't a resealable pop the can back on. It was when this is broken, this is broken. She comes up and breaks this jar and just anoints Jesus. Now for Matthew's audience, particularly this would have been interesting because we see historically in the Old Testament that they would anoint people right before important ceremonies. We see Solomon get anointed. We see David get anointed. We see Saul get anointed right before they become kings and priests. And so Matthew particularly would have been seeing this of going, wait, She's pouring oil over this guy, so she's not only anointing him so he'll smell a little different, she's doing something that's making him like kingly. She, she's saying something over him, particularly to the Jewish audience who would have been reading Matthew, much more profound than just, oh Jesus, here's something that costs a lot. Would you like it? And, and we don't know if she fully understood what she was doing, You know, because Lazarus has just just been raised from the dead, she may have really had the faith already to going, no, I'm telling you all, he is the redeemer. He is the Christ. He is our king and I anoint him as so. We don't fully know, but what we do know is that this woman comes up with a year's wage worth of oil and just covers Jesus. She, She saw Jesus as so worthy She said, nothing I have seems too extreme to offer him. We don't know where she got the oil. We don't know if it had been passed down generationally. We don't know if they'd been saving it up for a family member who was gonna pass away. We don't know. But what we know is she offered something so extreme. Why would someone do that? Because she saw the worth of the one she was offering it to. Verse eight And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, why this waste? What what is going on? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you trouble this woman? She's done a beautiful thing to me. Uh, One of the other gospels tells us that it was Judas leading the charge, and it's easy to kind of throw Judas under the bus because we know what's gonna happen in the life of Judas just a few verses later. But Matthew tells us that it was the disciples that saw it and they were all indignant. So at least there were enough of them that when they saw this anointing and and the the use of the oil on Jesus' head, there was enough of them that Matthew says, it wasn't just Judas, guys. They all were going, "What, what is happening right now? Like, do you have any idea what that is worth? Don't you wonder if Mary went, yeah, do you? Or, or what, what are, you ta- are we talking about the oil or are we talking about Jesus here? Because I, I, right now I'm not counting the cost of the oil, guys. Do you, do you have any idea what this is worth? Do you have any idea who's in your presence? The poor? You wanna go take care of the poor? That's, that's your objective right now? Do you have any idea who's physically in our midst right now? What, what worth are we talking about? I don't think she responded that way. I think she was just like, not my concern right now. Jesus is right here in front of me. But the disciples are indignant. And it's so easy for us to be like, man, those disciples were hard-headed. How did they still not get it? As I was studying this this week, I had a lot of grace for the disciples going, I'm not sure I would even consider the poor. And not that I don't consider the poor, but in the moment, they were at least going, hey, we could have done something else with this. I'm not sure what I would have considered in that moment. It's so easy to say, disciples, how did you not get it? But how often in my life on a Tuesday do I see things that could be used for the glory of God, and I go, oh, I'm not sure if it's worth it. Couldn't that, couldn't that time be used for something else? Couldn't my vacation days be used for something else? Couldn't my energies be spent for something else? 
But Jesus, aware of this, again, the disciples, as soon as they spoke, had to be like, oh, wait, he knows all things. We've seen him play this card trick on other people, and now he's doing it to us. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, hey, why do you trouble this woman? Again, we don't know how long the pause was there. Well, Jesus, I mean, like, this was a generational gift. Jesus, I mean, like, we're trying to eat dinner. Okay, but like, really, let's get to the heart of it. Jesus is never concerned about just our actions, right? Can we all agree with that? For, way t- for far too long, the church has talked about your actions, your actions, your actions, your actions. And they matter only in that they reveal your heart, Right, so I don't think Jesus was really going, hey, why are you troubling this woman? And they're going, well, the money and how much it could have been used. And he's going, yeah, okay, that's fine. I would like to invite you to go to one level deeper of going, yo, what is it really that bothers you about this offering? Why do you trouble her? What is it really that bothers you about affection being shown towards me? She has done a beautiful thing to me. I made this slide on purpose. And I left the two words that I think are really important on the same slide because the disciples say, why this waste? And Jesus says, she's done something beautiful. There will be moments in all of our lives where we will feel like we are a waste. Where the world will tell you, you were such a waste. Man, you wasted those years, didn't you? Man, what a wasted opportunity. Maybe some of you, even as I say that, are reminded of things your mom or your dad said to you. You just take up space in our house. Maybe it was an employer or employee who said something to you that you just can't unhear. Do you not see how everyone else is doing? Maybe it was in a play or on a sports field where somebody just said something over and you went, I take up space, I'm a waste. And maybe today, for some of you, you'd hear that Jesus go, hey, why are you so troubled? You're beautiful to me. Yeah, 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 and even now, maybe there's a narrative playing again and again in your head. Yeah, 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 of course. Of course Jesus says that, but. No, don't let the but cancel what comes before it. Hear Jesus say, if you've put your faith in me, you are beautiful to me. Did you waste those years? Maybe. But God goes, I'll make something beautiful out of it. You want a story of redemption like that starts today? Maybe some of you are just visiting, like spring break was a little tough and you're like, maybe we should try church. Maybe you're just visiting today. And maybe today will be the day that you go, my story is no longer about what I've done, but it's a story of beauty. It's a story of redemption. It's a story of God looking at my really feeble offerings And going, I can take that and make something beautiful out of it. Why do you trouble the woman? She's done a beautiful thing to me. For you will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. And so what Jesus does is he does not say, hey, don't care for the poor. He says, if that's really your objective, you will have the rest of your life to care for the poor. And you should. I've commanded you to. I've commanded you to have a heart for the orphan and for the widow, for those who are in need. If that's really your goal, spend the rest of your life doing it, disciples. Care for them in my name. Like I'm commanding you to go out and do that. But I don't think that's really what's going on. I don't think you're really concerned about them. I think you've forgotten the worth of who I am. And what Jesus points out is we are so good I am so good at taking the worth of Jesus and making it religion. Is it really about caring for the poor? Great, do that for the rest of your life, but don't miss who I am. Don't forsake me because of things that sound religious. Why? Because she's preparing my body for burial. She's doing something that you all still can't comprehend. The one who just raised people to life is about to be buried. It's beautiful. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. 
Now, isn't this amazing? It's happening, like today. We got to be a part of the Bible today. Jesus proclaimed it, and I just made it reality today. We're still a part of the story of God. She's still being remembered for what she did. So there's a few things that I think we can ask ourselves about this scripture to apply it to our life. This love story that we see and seeing the worth of Jesus and how our affections can line up with who he really is. And I've got three categories I'm gonna ask us to just consider that this woman, uh, Mary, I will say from here on out, the way that she offered to Jesus and what we can do with our own life. Three categories. The first is wasted or beautiful. When you think about your offerings to Jesus, do you think about, man, that was a real wasted opportunity? Or do you go, man, this is a beautiful thing I get to do for my Savior? When you look at your income, when you look at your time, when you look at your energy, when you look at the way that you work and you run it through the filter of how do I do this for my Savior, do you go, man, this seems like it's gonna be really costly. You want me to go to a foreign land or you want me to go down the street and share the gospel? Well, what if I'm misunderstood? What if I offer myself and they just don't respond the way that I would want them to? You and I have to start asking ourselves, in light of Jesus, is my life wasted or is it gonna be beautiful? When I consider the ways that God is offering himself to me, how will I offer myself to others? And will it be wasted or will it be beautiful? A couple of weeks ago, our middle school ministry uh, had their, it's called Dwell Conference, where they learn about the story of God. And so the last uh, morning I went over there and was just watching our middle schoolers worship and watching Zach, our student pastor, teach about how you can be a part of the story of God. It was a beautiful morning. Uh, They sang a song that our own student ministries wrote, very powerful. And I was just sitting there going, God, thank you so much for what you're doing. I mean, this is amazing to watch our students worshiping to our own song being wrapped up in the story of God. Well, so they end, and as all good youth ministries do, they were like, have a great weekend. Have fun at school tomorrow, whatever they said. I don't remember. And then they're like, joking, one more song. And they go into this just mosh pit style Jesus song, right? And the middle schoolers are like, they're doing our song, you know, and they all go crazy. Well, at one point, my daughter, who is a part, I've not asked for permission, so... If you're here, I'm so sorry. Um, Too late now. Uh, My daughter stands up on a chair. It's fine, right? We're in church, but it's fine. She stands up on a chair and she points and does this motion. And I'm back there with some of the youth pastors and I was like, oh, this is awesome. Wonder who she's wanting to come up there and dance with them. And she's like, and I was like, me? No. (laughs) And so I look at one of the youth pastors standing next to me. I was like, man, Annie wants me to go up there and like jump around with all them. And in that moment, it felt like the youth pastor was like, hey, that might be a unique invitation, pal. (laughs) And so I was like, I think I'm supposed to go jump around with a bunch of middle schoolers, aren't I? Now, as a 43-year-old man, did I think, you know what I think I wanna do today is go jump around for Jesus? (laughs) Actually, a little bit, but not like top of my list. Some of you are like, I've seen you down here. You might have been leading it. Whatever, that's not the point. Not really, But here's what I had to ask myself. What do I want our middle schoolers to think about men in our church? Hey, middle school is fine to go crazy for Jesus, but man, as you get older, you better learn how to control that a little bit. Or do I want our middle schoolers to go, hey, it's possible. It's possible to not waste your life and still love Jesus. Now, I didn't go really deep into that, but every step I took, I thought, man, I could look like a fool up here. And I probably did. I pray there's not a video of it. But I just thought, I want our middle schoolers to see you can be a grown man and go, I still love him. And it might be the best sermon I ever taught our middle schoolers. I don't know. But I had to evaluate, is my life gonna be calculated or will I say, Jesus, whatever you want from me, I'll give it. For some of you, it's dancing with a middle schooler. For others of you, it's starting to volunteer somewhere. And for some of you, it's just gonna be turning towards your spouse going, hey, we've wasted a few years. And I don't know if I'm ready, but let's turn towards each other a little bit. 
I've got some questions because often I find that questions are more helpful for me than anything. Ready? Where might Jesus be asking me to do something extravagant in my life? For this woman, it was offering her ointment. For me, it was dancing with my middle schooler. Where might Jesus be asking you to do something extravagant in my life? The number one rule here that I would have is don't compare to anybody else. Because for some of you, the extravagant thing is gonna be today. You're just raising your hand going, I need to put my faith in Jesus. And it's gonna feel like the most natural thing in the world to you because the spirit of God's doing something in your life. And it's not gonna feel like wild or it's not gonna feel like extravagant to you, but it is your next step of faith. For others of you, it is gonna be your marriage. For some of you, it's gonna be a job. And somebody's heart's going, please don't say this. For some of you, you know it is time to leave your job. You still don't exactly know what that means, but you know it's time. And you've been holding on to like find out what's next and the Lord's going, no, it's called faith. You don't know completely till you trust me and it's time for you to do something extravagant. For some of you, you need to write a check and it's a year's salary. And you're going, whoa, hold on. For some of you, that's not even a thing. And for some of you, you need to get on the level of your kid and go, dad, sorry. And all of those are beautiful, extravagant offerings to the Lord. If any voice, these are some truths to combat because we, every time we start to go down this road, voices take up residence in our head. If any voice, mine or others, tells me to moderate my affection for Jesus, don't listen to them. Like that's one of the most basic lines I could say, but I have to say it to myself all the time. If any voice, mine or others, tells me to moderate my affections for Jesus, don't listen. Don't listen. So will your life be wasted or beautiful. The next one is useful or beautiful. When you look at the life of the disciples, I think what they were really showing is they wanted to, Jesus to be useful to them. Do something for us, Jesus. We want you to be useful in our lives. Like, couldn't we take this very same offering and do something that the whole community would know about? I mean, can you imagine if we took a year's savings and just did it in one fell swoop to the community? They'd be like, wow, that's amazing. But like, let's do something useful, Jesus. And Jesus says, there's gonna be a tension in your heart that you can either be useful or beautiful. And particularly in your relationship with Jesus, do you want him to be useful to you or do you see him as beautiful to you? When you think about the ways that you come towards Jesus, Is it because you go, you're useful to me. Do something there. Move in this area. Fix this for me. Do you come to Jesus because he's useful or because he's beautiful? They are very different approaches to Jesus. Useful is I need forgiveness for this. I need you to bless this. I need you to open that door. I need you to close that door. I need you to move in their hearts. And it's not wrong, but if it's our primary motivation, we're coming to him for our sake and not his. And he is too valuable for me to approach him for my sake and not his. For men, this one's particularly hard. Because men, we like to get things done. We like to have tasks we like to know how things are gonna be accomplished. And men, I'll tell you all, I've been telling our staff for the last three months, there's somebody in this church, there's a man that I pray for. I don't know him, but I'm praying that at some point on a Sunday morning at this church, he'll just go, I'm alive. I'm alive. Not a church goer, I'm alive. And I don't see Jesus as useful, like he's not gonna send me to hell anymore and I think he might fix my marriage and I don't see him as useful, I just see him as beautiful. Like holy cow, for the first time my eyes are open to see, he's the beautiful one. That's all I know right now is he's beautiful. I don't care what he's gonna do for me, I just care that I know him and he's beautiful. 
men in your families, and I'm, just for a second, ladies, let me talk to the guys. Men in your families, could we be the people that set the precedent for saying Jesus is beautiful? What our culture needs is more men who will turn towards kids, wives, spouses, coworkers, and talk about the beauty of Jesus, not the usefulness of Jesus. I know that some, forget, some of you like our church because it's big. Some of you like our church because you look around and see who comes here. It's useful for you. You rub shoulders with the right people in the right community. Please don't come to our church because you think it's useful. But please, let's be men that go, man, he's beautiful. You go, man, that'd be so weird. Just see. Talk to your family. Talk to your coworkers. Talk to other men about the beauty of Jesus and go, man, this is weird. Or see if people around you go, oh, it's like life. You don't have to do it like I do it. You don't have to do it like Greg or Rick or RD does it. But can we be a church that's full of men and say, we will talk about the beauty of Jesus? How in my relationship with Christ could I focus on his beauty and not his usefulness? One of the ways you can do this is pray, pay attention to the prayers that you pray. Pay attention to the ways in which you approach Jesus. If any voice tempts me to pursue Christ for riches, power, ease, or success, I will not listen to them. Practically, one of the ways you can do this is we've created a prayer room on Tuesdays at our church from eight to nine o'clock in the morning and from 12 to one. Now, as soon as I say that, some of you go, mm, not useful, busy, okay? Is there any part of your schedule where you go out of your way to follow Jesus? It's too easy to make comparisons, so I won't do it, but I will ask, are there other areas of your life where if we said, hey, if you'll come somewhere at 8 a.m., you get an opportunity to, you'd be like, I'll be there, man. You don't have to come to this prayer room. But you do need to have some place in your life where you go, I'm not coming because it's useful. I'm coming because he's beautiful. I've sat in that prayer room. We've been doing this for a couple years now. Our student ministry started it. I've sat in that prayer room on some Tuesday mornings with three people. And I've never gone, well, this doesn't feel useful. There have been times where my mind has wondered. And I've kind of thought, could I be somewhere else? Should I be somewhere else? But when Jesus shows up unexpectedly on a Tuesday and you go, holy cow, you're so beautiful. There's nothing else that I go, you know what I should have been doing in that moment? So I just invite you to think about some ways that you could go after Jesus, not because he's useful, but because he's beautiful. The end of the story is this. Right after the woman anoints Jesus with oil, we'll talk about this again more next week, says this, then one of the 12 whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, what will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver, much less than what this woman had just offered to Jesus. And Judas said, a year's wages was ridiculous. 30 pieces of silver, yeah, he's, about, he's worth about that. They paid him 30 pieces of silver, and from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. So the last category for today is betrayal or beautiful. There are only two options. There are, please hear me say this with as much kindness as my heart can muster. There are only two options when it comes to Jesus and the cross. You either betray it or you think it's beautiful. There is no middle ground. Do not let Southern Christianity lull you into believing. Well, no, I'm just kind of in the, you're not in the middle. You are either betraying him or you see him as beautiful. Maybe for some of you, you're going, oh, I, I know it's been betrayal for the last couple of months. 
the beautiful thing about our Savior is that he takes all kinds. Those that have come to him for usefulness, those for him that have gone, man, I feel like I've wasted my life. God, do something with it. And even those who have betrayed him, he says, there is room for you too. Do I rejoice in the power of the cross? Really? And isn't it funny how one simple word, at least for me, changes it? Because do you rejoice in the power of the cross? Oh, absolutely. No, really? And again, I don't mean this as judgment. I just mean this as we're heading towards Easter. Do we really have time to play game, the church game? This is a terrible game. Do you really rejoice in the power of the cross? Or do you just kind of know that this is what you're supposed to be doing? Could it be that for some of you today, you go, no, I'm done playing the game. I'm done actually betraying Jesus with my life, but like doing this Christian thing. And today I wanna say, no, Jesus, I do see you as beautiful. I do see what you've done for me is absolutely magnificent. And I'm done playing the game by grace. And having faith, I wanna put my faith in you and all the miniature ways that I've betrayed you throughout the week, I just confess today, Lord, I want to be seen as someone who sees you as beautiful. If any voice tells me that the death and resurrection of Jesus is anything less than triumph over death, don't listen. You know, Jesus, he was a great example. Nope, I'm not listening to that. He was more than an example. He was a sacrificial atonement for my sins. He is a beautiful savior. He is not just a moral character who taught me a better way to live. I will not buy into that because I'm gonna celebrate. No, he's the beautiful savior who died and rose for my sins. So wasted or beautiful? Useful or beautiful? Betrayal or Beautiful. On this day, all it takes is faith in Jesus for him to look at us and go, hey, because of your faith in me, I see you as beautiful. True love never calculates. Have you been calculating your faith? Genuine worship is never measured. The woman didn't open the jar and be like, is this, she's like, no, I'll just break it. You can have it all, Jesus. Authentic affection never asks, how little can I give and still meet the accepted standards of decency in West Knoxville? True heartfelt adora- adoration never asks, what is the minimum I can get by with and not be thought of as others by holding back? The heart of true worship is unfamiliar with the word enough and utterly oblivious to what is deemed fitting by others. Mary saw Jesus as one whose beauty and worth were so infinitely more satisfying than all rival pleasures that nothing she gave, nothing she gave up to gain him felt like a sacrifice. May it be said of us too.